Hi, it's teardown time. Even better than that, it's retro computer teardown time. We love retro computers here on the EEV log. They're one of my more popular teardowns. Today, we've got the classic Apple 2C from 1984. <laughs> Let's check it out. And still works. Beauty. And thank you very much to Oliver who gave this to me at the recent uh, Maker Fair in Sydney. Here's Oliver. Thanks, mate. Um, he actually found it on local uh, curbside garbage collection. So it came with the machine, the original controller, uh, the original power supply. We've got a mouse and a whole bunch of floppies as well. Awesome. Thanks, Oliver. So the 2C came out in 1984. It was not a successor to the Apple IIe. They actually sold them at the same time. The C in the 2C actually stands for compact. And as you can see, it is basically a pretty small and compact unit considering that it has a built-in five and a quarter inch floppy drive. That was one of the big uh, selling points of this puppy back in the day. And it even having a carry handle on the back. Carry handle's actually uh, fallen off this one. So you can actually carry it around. I don't know if anyone really did that because you've got to actually lug around this huge big brick linear uh, power supply as well this big huge uh, transformer um so yeah it wasn't really compact it wasn't really portable in that sense because a didn't have a battery uh, external power supply and it didn't have any built-in display the most common display for this thing was the uh, small crt which i do not have unfortunately which went um sat on a uh, case this thing was actually tilted up like this so that you could uh, it, you know it was more ergonomic to use the keyboard and then the display would come over the top and it would sit in I'll probably link in a photo there or there was also an optional uh, one color I believe it was LCD screen which sort of sat on the top here and kind of made it look like a little laptop but it wasn't really no internal battery but still you know, this was a reasonably popular machine back in the day. Um, a lot of people compared it to the uh, IBM PC Junior at the time. That was a bit of a failure. And I guess maybe a lot of people will say the 2C was a failure as well. But it is a classic machine. Now, it differed slightly from the Apple II in that it, while it used the 65A2 processor, it used the 65C02, which is the new CMOS version of it. As such, there were slight differences in there, which meant that not all software, which made use of some quirks in the original 6502, they couldn't run on this 2C, but it was pretty much compatible, basically a compatible uh, chip in the end. And it worked at the same screaming, just over one megahertz beauty. And it came with 128K of RAM, uh, the 140K five and a quarter inch uh, floppy built in as well, whereas uh, the Apple II, of course, all that sort of stuff was separate. Um, it's got an 80 uh, column mode as well that was all built in so this had a lot of stuff built in uh, serial ports as well on the back built in mouse port these are all optional extra on the 2e the 2e of course had uh, all the expansion slots in it or the original apple II, all the as well as the 2e all the um, expansion slots in it this has no expansion capability at all but it's most of the stuff you needed to have a functioning computer were built in. So it was, you know, it was pretty decent in that respect. Didn't really need expansion capability in this sort of thing. But I guess it wouldn't be nice. But you can't fit it in a nice compact case like this. And it had both RGB monitor and composite monitor outputs. We'll use the composite output today to actually um, see if we can play Zork on this thing. Beauty. And uh, it whopping 560 by 192 graphics, 15 colors. Eh, it wasn't that shabby for the time, I guess. But yeah, there were better machines out there. But still, it was fairly reasonable for the time. The original retail price about 1300 US dollars that was from 30 years ago 1984 dollars here Woo! that was a lot of money but hey it was a fully functioning computer with like 128k of ram and everything and i also used the integrated was machine custom asic chip to actually replace the dedicated disc controller in this thing so it'll be interesting to crack this puppy open and here it is. It's not in bad uh, condition for its age. Yes, it has uh, yellowed. Very common for the time. That comes uh, from the bromide in the plastics that they used to use uh, leaching out. So very common. You can fix it, but it's, yeah, it's not that um, easy. Uh, five and a quarter inch floppy drive, as I said. There we go. Ha <laughs> look at that. Whopping 140k per disc. Double-sided too. Beauty. And we've got some ventilation uh, slots here in the top. It looks like it's got a uh, filter 
uh, on the top of it so you can't actually uh, see the circuitry uh, down in there to keep all the dust and crap out. And the keyboard's actually really nice. I liked the uh, style of the keys with the sort of the flat part and then they're raised up in the middle. And I love, you know, I loved, always loved the feel of this uh, keyboard. The only time I ever used a 2C actually, uh, I didn't know anyone who owned one. The only time I ever got to play with one was at the local library. They, this was their main computer in the local library and you had to go in and give your, hand your library card over. They'd give you the floppy disks and, you know, you could go over and use it. You know, you could book it for an hour or whatever. And use the thing so I used to do that back in the day wow what was that yeah mid 80s jeez now there was actually two models of the 2C uh, this is the original 2C there was also the 2C plus and it came out in 1988 when this one uh, finished selling this so this one had a four-year uh, lifetime and the major the two major changes in that are uh, they actually replaced the um, 80 uh, 40 column uh, switch here switches here with a uh, volume they actually had a volume uh, slider here and they also changed the uh, five and a quarter inch floppy to a three and a half inch floppy and the 2C Plus also ran at 4 megahertz instead of the 1 megahertz that this uh, ancient puppy did. But unfortunately, I, I think it was a bit of a flop at the time, the 2C Plus, because uh, Apple had already released the uh, 2GS, uh, the graphics and sound model, which had a really advanced uh, graphics and sound capability for its day. And they didn't include any of that in the 2C uh, Plus. So yeah, this original 2C, it's even worse. It's got like one bit sound and well, yeah, okay, it can do 560 by 192 15 color graphics, but yeah, pretty ordinary. In the side here, we've got ourselves headphones and a volume slider for the speaker that's tucked up under there. And there's the label for those playing along at home. Uh, it doesn't, I don't think it has a date, so I'm not sure what the uh, barcode um, thing here is if that's a serial number I'm not or or what's going on there I'm not entirely sure but yeah basically um 18 watts for the CPU whoa geez you can fly to Alpha Centauri on 18 watts if we have a look on the back here we've got ourselves a, a serial mouse port we've got ourselves a uh, modem uh, comms interface that's our RGB uh, monitor output that's our composite uh, monitor output which we're going to be using today um, another external second uh, floppy disk drive a serial printer and the DC power connector using old school DIN connectors of course look at that you can see some, the connectors there are a little bit crusty but uh, yeah she still works hmm this thing's seen better days and there's the money shot for the fanboys and as I said, this is where the carry handle uh, goes. And it did come with the carry handle, but look, very different uh, type of plastic. It hasn't, hasn't yellowed at all, so maybe. Um, yeah, it's like an entirely different type of plastic. Didn't have the bromide in there to actually uh, leach out. So, you know, fade with all that uh, ultraviolet exposure. So anyway, um, I don't know how they got that in and out without taking the case off. Hmm... Anyway, you can carry this around. Oh, look, I've got my Apple IIc with my big linear transformer as well. Hmm, and my monitor. And there's the brick power supply for it. <laughs> it's an IEC uh, input connector here, but uh, yeah, it's just a whopping great big transformer. And that had a nominal output of uh, 15 volts DC at 1.2 amps or so. So yeah, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be uh, regulated at all. That'd just be a bridge rectifier, a full wave bridge rectifier and uh, some output caps and bogs your uncle. But it did have all the requisite type approvals. Beauty. And here's an original Apple mouse as well. How original? Wow, look at the serial number. 20,452. Jeez, that's pretty good for Australia. I, I'm, yeah, 20th, 1,000th Apple mouse ever made. It's not many at all. Made in the United States of America. And the main unit assembled in Ireland. To be sure, to be sure. Here we go. Let's try and boot this puppy up. I've got one of these uh, car rear view mirror LCD reversing camera thingamabobs. Um, it'll do. It's got composite uh, video input. We're going to try and play Zork 2. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, I got the original tab. Can you remember putting the tabs on to the right protect tab? Side A is Zork 2. Side B, nothing. So let's whack that in the drive and clunk that down. You have to go clunk, 
back in the day. I'll try not to get glare on the screen. And here we go. Let's try and boot it. Listen to the sounds of then. It's reading the floppy. Come on. You can do it. Hey, doesn't like that. And we're in like Flynn. It works. It still reads a floppy disk after like 30 years. More than 30 years. Unbelievable. So we can go. Let's play. Zork. Pick up. Sword. Why does it have to access the disk? Got to access the disk. You're, oh, no, it doesn't like that. Oh, internal error. Wah. Floppy drive's a bit dodgy, I'm afraid. Let's try that again. Here we go. We've got our Apple IIc. We're in. And pick up sword. Yeah, why can't it? It's got 128k of RAM. Why can't it uh, load? Why does it have to keep reading the disk? Jeez, just to do... Ah, oh, no, it... Trust me, it does work. Hmm. Anyway, you can see that it still works 30 years later. Fantastic, I love it. Now, the thing with the Apple IIc is that uh, it's really quite annoying. If you boot the thing up without a floppy disk in it, then uh, you get the Apple IIc up there, and then you just get... What? check disk drive there's nothing like it doesn't pop straight up into your basic uh command prompt so the way you do that um which is <laughs> completely non-obvious control reset like that and bingo we're at our prompt and we can find out uh what version of the rom we had we can go uh peak minus 1089 that is completely obvious of course and we've got rom version 255 and if we do call minus 151, ta-da, we enter the monitor. Oh, the power. Can you feel it? You can also do the exact same thing using the command print peak 6447, which again is completely obvious. Um, and this is 255 means it's the original ROM version. Kill. Grew. Wah, 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 wah. If you don't reset it properly, uh, chucks are wobbly. And it came with a whole bunch of these discs. They aren't Apple original. They're all like um, Apple, uh, use, Sydney Apple Users Group. Look at that, Blackjack and Cards, the Apple Fest, 1992. Ah, oh, fantastic, double-sided. Ah, oh, even a sticker on the bottom. Integer on flip side, love it. So there you go. Anyone remember the Apple, or was anyone part of the Sydney Apple Users Group? Is this your machine? Did you dump it on the roadside? Oh, surely not. Anyway, yeah, no original uh, disc. We've got Masters Beginner, Calc Lair, whatever that is. Anyway, we've got a whole bunch of them. Fantastic. Which one do we want? I'll have Global Thermonuclear War. So it looks like this was like a monthly disc or something and uh, from the users group and came with a whole bunch of different uh, programs by the looks of it. All right, let's crack this puppy open and see what uh, Cupertino has to offer. Now, it's all going to be uh, through-hole dip technology, of course. That's pretty much what it uh, was back in uh, the 80s. So, don't expect any uh, surface mount stuff in here at all. I'm not sure. Well, we've got four bigger screws here. I'm not sure what uh, the deal is there. But, anyway, um, I... Not sure if the Woz himself actually worked on this because he, after his plane crash in the early 80s, uh, left Apple for a bit. He did come back and famously, um, you know, worked as just an engineer. And But I don't think he's ever credited with the two Cs. So um, probably working on the uh, 2GS uh, more than the 2C, because this is basically just an Apple II, and then they just, you know, it's just packaging integration and stuff like that. Probably something that the was wouldn't have been that interested in, I'd be guessing. So these four here are actually metal threaded inserts, where the uh, other ones were just um, self-tappers into the plastic. So I'm not sure if this is the correct order to 
take it apart. I guess we'll find out. We're getting somewhere. Oh, I can see the crusty phenolic base single-sided board for the keyboard. Um, something came out here, a bit of rubber, sort of rubber strip. Um, that looks like it's surrounding the keyboard, but uh, it's probably clips on the back or something like that. But yeah, this top plate obviously, obviously just comes off somehow. There we go. There we go. Oh, almost. Ta-da! We're in like Flynn. Errol, that is. And as you can see, there's not a huge amount doing here. We've got uh, dominated by the big uh, five and a quarter inch uh, floppy. We'll take that out uh, separately, of course. And uh, that was, you know, 140k job. And of course, there was famously with the Apple drives, actually how he got the cost down was just had the mechanism uh, itself and then developed his own interface electronics and famously did it with like five chips or something. Can't remember the exact number. And that was in the original uh, Apple. And then for the Apple, starting with his 2C, I believe, and then the 2GS and uh, other ones, they uh, put it that same circuitry into a small um, ASIC uh, chip or PLD or whatever it was. And that became the integrated WAS machine. So as I remarked before, the keyboard itself, this is not high quality uh, fiberglass board. It's what's called a uh, phenolic base uh, board. It's very cheap, very common in uh, consumer gear. So nothing inherently wrong with it. Um, they still use it today. You open up any, you know, you open up your $5,000 uh, LCD TV or something and you'll probably find that the power supply uses a phenolic uh, base board. They can shave a few cents off there, so they do. Um, so yeah. Yeah, we've got a ribbon up here that uh, connects that down in there. So that actually uh, just slides into, they've put a little cutout in the drive there. That's pretty good. Ta-da! Oh, we're more in like Flynn. Look at that. I actually really liked how they've added this uh, strengthening bar across here. This is probably like, you know, ABS plastic or something, but that strengthens the keyboard. So um, you can see that that brace is in there and over in here. So that'll, so when you've got this in like this, when you press in the middle of the keyboard, it doesn't flex and feel cheap and nasty. So that's a, that's a really nice addition there. Somebody was thinking. And if we take a look at the main guts down here, we've got ourselves a date code. The main uh, 65CO2 made by NCR, by the way. There you go. It was, yep, made by all and sundry back in the day. Uh, date code, uh, fourth week 84. Uh, we've got first week 84. We've got 31st week 84. But uh, these are fairly, you know, they might have had, you know, a ton of these in stock. DRAMs were like, these were the precious thing back in day. My precious. And uh, we've got a date code of um, first week 80, uh, fifth week 85. So there you go. This, uh, they would have put this into production like weeks after that. So very early 1985 vintage, this machine. And here's some attention to detail on the EMC, the electromagnetic uh, conformity for this thing. This is like a steel ring here, like a, you know, a steel wool steel mesh ring that connects the, uh, one of the ground points here, and this is one of the mounting posts for the uh, floppy drive. So that just uh, electrically connects the floppy drive down to the main board there. Very nice. They've got uh, two of those. And there you go. That's just for the 6502 fan boys. And of course, it wouldn't be an early 80s computer without a couple of bodges on it. There we go. Genuine mod wire there. And a resistor going between the pin on this uh, gal slash power device over to uh, one of the vias there. <laughs> nice. No surprises for finding the famous integrated WAS machine ASIC up here. There it is, IWM, right next to the uh, floppy port, of course. There's the internal floppy connector, there's the external floppy connector. So I haven't actually looked at the uh, schematic and architecture of this thing yet, but obviously, like, they're just uh, parallel uh, data, and then they've probably just got a different uh, selection or uh, some other uh, miscellaneous control lines for the separate uh, floppy drive. You probably couldn't use both at once. Now it's interesting to note that this is the original Apple uh, 2C and you can tell because all there is no memory expansion. All the memory, the 128K is on the board here, right down here. Now in 1986 they did release a memory expansion version of this. It's a substantially different uh, board layout and it's got a, um, here's a photo of it, it's got a memory expansion connector down here and this allows you to expand the memory and thing. Not so in this original one and you can see there's a few other uh, circuit changes as well. 
One thing I really like about these old machines is that they put proper silkscreen labels on. Look, they told you what all the uh, block parts of the unit were, what all the main chips. Look, IWM, Integrated Was Machine, TMG, that's the uh, main timing uh, chip, uh, GLU, that's a, uh, it's, well, it's glue logic, but it stands for, uh, you know, general purpose uh, interface logic unit. Um, we've got our character generator up here, we've got video latch here, and there's the 80 latch, uh, for example, for the 80 column mode, and just everything is labelled. It's brilliant. And the main elements down here, I've already uh, pointed out the main uh, CPU, the MMU, that's the memory management unit, handles all the memory addressing and all that sort of jazz. Um, IOU, that's pretty uh, obvious, that's the um, IO uh, interface, IO peripheral uh, type interface. And then we've got our uh, character generator uh, ROM here, that's what MAP stands for, character, you know, keyboard mapping unit. And then MON down here is monitor, of course, the old school uh, word for the um, firmware. And this puppy here is the um, ink, which is uh, encoder, and of course that's the keyboard encoder, because you need a uh, keyboard encoder to decode all the uh, keys, of course, like to do the um, matrix address uh, mapping. As you can see, there's basically uh, nothing for the sound here. Here's our volume uh, knob over here on the side, our headphone output, and just like, yeah, there's no sound chip, no nothing. It was just single bit sound output. Beep, beep, beep. And you might actually have been wondering about this switch here that looks like a keyboard. That's because it is the keyboard switch. And what that one does is it switches between your standard layout like this, that every, your QWERTY layout, and a Devor, old school Dvorak layout. So yeah, for those Dvorak uh, fans, I guess you could get like a different key uh, tops and put them on. And um, Or maybe they actually sold a Dvorak uh, uh, configured uh, machine for those, uh, yeah, Dvorak fans. So, anyway, yeah, nobody does that anymore, do they? Does anyone out there use a Dvorak keyboard? Come on, there must be somebody. So what happens with your keyboard, of course, is the keyboard encoder uh, takes the uh, keyboard matrix and gives you a matrix location of which actual key was pressed, and then the character uh, generator map ROM here, because that's effectively what it is. It's just a uh, it's just a ROM, essentially a lookup table that then converts that matrix value into a particular ASCII character, which then can be uh, displayed on the screen and everything else. And these two S655 uh, ones, uh, which are uh, labelled 685 ones here on the uh, silk screen, they're actually your two uh, serial chips, because this thing had uh, two serial ports on it. And the main clock for this thing, there it is, 14.24982 megahertz. And that, in combination with the uh, timing chip here, generated all the system timing, including the main uh, processor clock. So the main processor clock run at just over one megahertz, they would have divided that puppy in here by 14. We've got one! Yes! Triple five timer! <laughs> well, a dual triple five timer, the 556. Five, Brilliant! And the ventilation slots on the back here, I don't know how they're working that well, because there's a metal uh, grid on there. I'll show you. might be able to see that on the other side. And then there's an insulating card under there, of course, because you can't have the bottom of these uh, dip packages shorting out to the metal on the back. So there's like that just covering up all the all the vent holes are under there. What the? That's not going to be effective at all. There they are. We've got a metal screen under there, but um, yeah, the board just sat flat on there. It's, yeah, useless. And just for kicks, we'll check the processor clock. Now, we need the uh, pin 37 of the 6502, which is the main uh, input uh, clock phase and the 6502 actually has uh, separate uh, clock outputs as well. So there you go, my uh, Rigol scope 1.01562 megahertz or thereabouts. You can see that it's all a little bit jittery here. Now I don't know if there's like a, the odd missing uh, cycle in there or not. I'm not sure what's going on. So if we stop it and go in, it all looks. Uh, it all looks fairly, fairly normal, so you might have some trigger jitter, oh, no, oh, no, is that my imagination? We might have some trigger jitter or something in there, but that looks, eh, see, a little bit jittery. Oh, what's going on? 
Well, yeah, I'm not sure that's actually trigger jitter. I think it's uh, something genuine on the clock. So, I'm not sure what's happening there. I don't know enough about the uh, Apple uh, timing chip to, uh, to know what that deal is. There you go, there's the main processor clock and it's rock solid. Oh, it's a little bit rounded off there because I've got uh, my bandwidth limit uh, turned on and I'm not exactly uh, probing this uh, properly, hence all the ringing and crap like that. But yeah, it's rock solid. So there's something else. Um, yeah, so the timing coming out of the timing chip, it's probably missing a pulse here or there for uh, some particular reason. Maybe some sort of, you know, I don't know, interrupt, wait steady type thing. And even Apple couldn't escape the clutches of Bill. There we go, copyright Microsoft 77, because there's some uh, Microsoft Basic happening in there. And all we've really got left to look at is this brick here, this nice big shield of brick, TDK, dead giveaway. That's a DC to DC converter. Here's our DC input from our linear uh, plug pack that we've got. Um, this looks like a melted capacitor on the top, but it's, uh, it's not. I think it's a big... Uh, yeah, it's just a big wrapped uh, wire wound inductor there, just a big choke. And then we just got a big uh, mains input up filter cap nip on Chemicon. Thank you very much. Tell you what, though, I do really like how they've got the card edge connector here. Completely separate shield and enclosure. And along with those um, uh, shielding um, EMI uh, gaskets I told you about going up to the floppy drive, they, they took EMI reasonably seriously um you know it's hard when you've got like a uh, a double-sided board like this and you just got traces buses big buses running everywhere but uh you know they're done a pretty decent job there how does that come out it's got to pull out there we go we're in like flynn well i'll tell you what I don't mind that puppy at all. That looks actually quite nice. End-on resistors, which were uh, lead-formed end-on resistors, very common for the day, of course. And uh, that's a very nice, clean, neat layout. Huge, big uh, ground plane on the top. Nippon Chemicon uh, caps, fantastic. No expense spared there. And so, you know, they're, they're still going. No leaks in those whatsoever. And uh, that's a very nice implementation of a DC... The DC converter, I'm not sure how many uh, rails it's got. It'll have 5 volts and minus 5 volts and 12 volts or something. Um, from a 12 to 15, uh, like up to 15 volt input from the uh, plug pack. And if I put it back together and just take the lid off, you can see this uh, bracket that they're using at an angle there to hold in and push the uh, switching transistor across um, against uh, the back end here, which is using this as a heatsink. That's... Rather novel, but um, yeah, a little bit convoluted to try and get in though. And last, but certainly not least, <laughs> this ugly looking uh, floppy drive here. But my hat's off, it still worked. I found some gunk in here and everything. So it, it, it still worked a treat. It just goes to show the robustness of these things, really. It's just incredible. And of course, there's our head right down in there. And if we whack our floppy in of course so there you go and then the stepper motor just moves the head in and out and turns the disc not much going on there at all but i love the bottom look at this they've got an old school timing chart on here so that you can actually get the rotational speed with your uh, stroboscope <laughs> fantastic and made in japan hi to all my japanese viewers um it's an alps drive and serial number only sixty thousand. that's that's pretty low. This is one of the earlier units, really. I mean, how many of these things did they make? A million Apple two C's? I'm not sure of the exact uh, number, but as you can see, there's not much on here at all. There's just uh, motor uh, control stuff, uh, pretty much, because all of the um, digital uh, decoding and uh, head uh, amplifier and stuff like that. But apart from that, um, there's, you know, there's bugger all on here because all of it, because uh, Woz did his own uh, controller famously and that saved a lot of the cost there now of course on this because it's a single-sided disc this top part here isn't the head it's just like a uh, it's just like a little uh, felt uh, pad type thing there is our head right down in there there we go it's got some gunk on it that could do with some cleaning oh there it is look at that for those who remember back in the day um you used to be able to get uh, five and a quarter inch uh, cleaning disc it was like a cloth 
uh, instead of having like the mylar uh, magnetic coated disc itself, that it actually had like a, a cloth in there, like a microfibery type cloth that didn't have microfiber back then, I don't know, an equivalent type thing. And then you'd put your, uh, you'd put your cleaning fluid onto that, you'd stick it in and then you'd start the drive up and clean your head. I think that's what we need to do here. Hmm. What you need is a cotton swab like this and you need some isopropyl alcohol. This is the uh, pure stuff, 99.8%. Or you can also use one of these uh, medical swabs as well. These are only 70% uh, alcohol, but they'll do the business. So they've actually got a little uh, cleaning cloth inside already pre-moistened. So you can actually use that to just to get in there and wipe the head. Now we just lift up this uh, pressure pad here because this is only a single-sided uh, drive. The uh, double-sided ones will have uh, heads on both sides and they'll actually have a head on this uh, mechanism that lifts up so you'll have to do both but just repeat it and we can see our head in there very very dirty look at that so we've dipped our cotton bud in the alcohol uh, not too much but just get in there and start scrubbing you can see it might take a bit of elbow grease this one I don't think this one's been cleaned in 30 years maybe hmm And there we go. Head is perfectly clean now. Now just make sure there's no uh, fibers in there. Just get inside because you can actually get fibers that come off these. If you get good uh, micro uh, fiber type uh, cotton buds, they're the best. Now you shouldn't wipe this at all because the alcohol will just evaporate. So don't worry about it. Just leave it a few minutes and she'll be right. Here we go. That's one five hundredth. Shutter speed and you can see the inner loop which was the 50, almost standing still, almost. Oh, pretty close. And this disk drive seems to be working a treat after we uh, cleaned it. I think there's something wrong, physically wrong with the Zork disk. I can see some physical uh, damage to it. So anyway, I'm loading another one, checking out. High resolution demonstration. Oh, biorhythms, they were all the go back in the day. Oh, let's go for the uh, USS Enterprise, high res picture. Oh, got to do it. Okay, I think what's happening here is this LCD somehow maybe not can be compatible with the graphics mode. Perhaps, I, regardless of what program I seem to run, if I try and go into graphics mode, it just blank screen. So, oh, sorry. There we go. You saw it. We had the Enterprise. I'll try and capture that. Fantastic. So there you go, that's a uh, probably a rather lengthy look at the Apple 2C, the original one, not to be confused with the 2C Plus or that one uh, with the upgraded memory module. 1990, uh, this was like uh, the first early weeks, 1995, so this is just over 30 years old and it still works beauty. No problems with the power supply because they use top quality caps in there, it's well built and really not much that can wrong, go wrong with, uh, you know, 5 volt TTL. Um, stuff at all and the floppy drive amazingly um, still works. I've cleaned that and oh, I think I'll just go play some Zork. And by the way, I'll link in um, the full service manual for this thing. It's got the schematics and it's like 560 pages and it's got the ROM dump listing and oh man, everything including the kitchen sink. It's fantastic. They really did proper technical reference manuals. Um, service manuals back in those days. It's fantastic. So terrific bedtime reading. So if you like that, please give it a big thumbs up on YouTube because that always helps a lot. And if you want to discuss it, uh, YouTube comments or evblog.com forum or blog down below. Catch you next time.